I think local manufacturing will be a lot of the future of solar. I think at the moment, one of the issues is silicon factories. You need a lot of capex to build them. You need lots of infrastructure. You need to uh, process these at very high temperature. So you do need lots of infrastructure, lots of energy associated with that. So it is hard to roll out factories quickly. And, and therefore, those places that can do it uh, at low cost, you know, are going to uh, are sort of dominating. The other issue is, of course, that, you know, having all of our manufacturing in two or three geographical centers is, is a big risk going forward. And I think it's these new technologies, you know, for example, perovskite, where you can actually have much more modular manufacturing, much more modular factories, where you could have smaller factories that would be viable and more diverse in where they are as well, which could actually alleviate um, all of these issues. Hello and welcome to Energy Unplugged by Aurora. This podcast features various experts from Aurora having in-depth conversations with key industry leaders, policymakers and academics from all over the world. It explores the hottest topics across the energy market and gives a unique perspective on major energy issues. Welcome to Energy Unplugged. I'm John Fedderson, founder and chief executive of Aurora. And my guest on the show today is at the forefront of research into the next generation of solar technology. Academically, he's a leader of Strax Lab at Cambridge University's Department of Chemical Engineering and Biotechnology, where there are around 40 researchers. His research focuses on perovskite solar technology. He's published in many of the leading academic journals, including Science on multiple occasions and Nature. And I looked on uh, Google Scholar recently, and in the last few years, he's been cited about 7,000 times per annum. So clearly having a big impact on global academic research. He's won all the big early career awards you can in his field, uh, Royal Society Research Fellowship, Mary Curie Fellowship at MIT. Uh, and that's just in academia. Outside academia, he's the founder of California-based Swift Solar which aims to manufacture the next wave of solar generation technology. That's a perovskite tandem technology that we will hear more about shortly. And he's also recently co-founded SustainEd, which is a not-for-profit, which focuses on uh, developing education for school-age children around climate change solutions. And they're currently operating in 10 schools. My guest on the show is Sam Stranks. Welcome, Sam. Thanks very much, John. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, well, thanks for thanks for carving time out of your very busy schedule to join us. Um, I'd like to start with your background and your history. Uh, what like what exactly? Uh, like, I, I obviously can't do credit to it, and and you know, don't you know, it's a generalist audience here, so let's not get too technical either. But what exactly is your academic area of expertise? Yeah, so my well, my background. I'm a physicist by background. Uh, and did, did a bit of chemistry as well. So a lot of what we do is, is, is physics and trying to understand the physics of solar cells. Uh, in particular, what we're working on is, is new materials that can be much more efficient uh, for, for generating solar power. So harvesting sunlight and, and converting that sunlight to electricity. Uh, so we, we do a lot of work on developing these new materials such as these, these perovskites that I'll, I'll tell you more about, uh, and, but also understanding these materials. So we use a lot of uh, laser spectroscopy. So we use fast lasers to, to uh, energize electrons in these materials. And we look at uh, how fast these charges lose their energy to heat and, and how well they can be collected. So that tells us a lot about how these solar cells work and, and how efficient they can be. Okay. So it, it's very experimental, it sounds like. So like your main tools are, are conducting experiments with expensive equipment. That's right. Exactly right. So yeah, we have, we have a big team of researchers and we do um, sort of spanning from Sort of the, the chemistry of making these materials through to, 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 to characterizing them. So, so, yes, we're experimental making these materials and, and testing them, uh, but also trying to, to trying to push them into the commercialization phase as well. Yeah. Okay. And so, a, a natural question. So, you started your PhD in around 2008. I think you, some of your undergraduate research has been on the wine industry or something like that. But Sorry. why? In 2008, solar was really expensive back then, right? I don't think anyone, certainly I didn't, foreshadowed the cost declines that we've seen for existing technologies, uh, you know, the silicon type technology over the last 15 years or so. What made solar research attractive to you around 2008? Yeah, good, good, good question. I mean, I think, first of all, I wanted something that, um, you know, I could do some 
do some physics on interesting things and I had you know the passion on on the physics side of things but then also um you know climate change has always been something that that I've been passionate about and some so how could I combine both those things and, and solar energy and solar technologies that you know a, a perfect mix of those uh, it, it is actually quite interesting looking back at when I when I did start around that 2008 period uh because solar was so expensive there was a, the mantra that we if we could develop a new technology that was uh, 10 efficient and it could last for 10 years it would already be competitive with with silicon solar cells which is you know the, the mainstream technology uh that's changed very quickly uh you know the, the, obviously the, the price of solar came down very quickly the efficiency of the the panels did go up as well uh and so that so the the the, the goalposts have moved uh, extensively um, so that means a lot of those materials that I, I started working on organic solar cells in particular. So these are materials made from very cheap organic molecules, and uh, and 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 they were you know looming as something that could be a very widespread technology in terms of uh, getting us towards sort of terawatt scale. Uh, it's those have been surpassed by some of these perovskite materials, for example, which which are actually efficient and competitive with uh, with with the silicon technology. Yeah, interesting. I suppose it's been good for the world that the the goalposts have moved. The bar has been raised. Very good for the world. Uh, but uh, but 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 I suppose makes it challenging. And I hope we have a chance to talk about lock in effects with technologies because obviously a big a big part of what you're trying to do is take a technology that has had zero investment and compete with a technology that has had you know billions, hundreds of billions of dollars of in, investment, which is um, you know not 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 easy. I would imagine. Um, Okay, can I just just on that t- topic, right? So uh, implicitly, you know, so you chose solar rather than wind. I'm, I'm going to assume it was sort of more interesting academically. You, you know, wind turbines are big steel, rotating things. There's, there's certainly less chemistry. If you were starting your PhD now, and of course you weren't, you know, number one option is like Strang's lab, perovskites. That's exactly where you want to be. But if you weren't doing that and you wanted to do something about climate change, what would you research? now like what sort of what sort of area is it hydrogen is it green hydrogen CCUS? yeah it's a very, yeah. very good question i mean i think i mean even from the solar perspective there's still a huge amount to do i mean i, I would certainly make solar still one of the the, the key uh, focuses of the lab there's still you know huge efficiency gains that we can get from from uh, not only new materials but also adapting them in new ways to really actually go well and truly beyond what we have now uh, i think one of the one of the you know really exciting things about running a lab is you do have freedom to, to move and to pivot and to fact adopt new uh, research lines. And, and we've been doing that. In fact, in a lot of the imaging we're doing for solar cells, for example, we've start, now started imaging some battery technologies, for example, started looking also at some quantum computing systems as well, which is all you know very much tangential to, to our main goals of solar, but it, it does give us that opportunity to do that. Um, but, but certainly, I, I you know maybe it sounds cliche, I would, I would still have a big strong focus on solar because I think it's something where understanding the physics of these materials and really engineering new materials that can be more efficient and much cheaper at scale uh, is a very fruitful avenue. Yeah. And interesting, the, just on the whole diversifying the strengths lab portfolio, you've got 40 people there, you've got all, is it, how do you, how do, in academia, how does the support work for that, right? Is it, is it basically you're going out to funding bodies and saying, look, I've done great work in perovskites, but presumably at some point you hadn't done any work in quantum computing, but it's like, you know, trust me, I could do it. I could do it with that. I can do it with this type of thing or how does it, it is, the, how it do you is a lot of that. Someone? So yeah, exactly. Building up a track record in one area. So for example, the quantum computing, what we, we do a lot of work on lighting as well. So that's um, essentially a solar cell run in reverse is, is an LED and, and emits light. So there's a track record built up about photons being emitted. And for the quantum applications, we're looking at, at single photon emitters, which are a built, which is a building block for a quantum computer. Uh, okay, interesting. Yeah. Okay, so okay. So de- definitely related. Um, it's, uh, it's related enough. There's enough of a track record to show we can do it, but it is, it is it, we do have the freedom to move into that space and, and to pitch that to a, to a funder. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. So that's the academic bit. I, I wanted to ask one other thing about, about, you know, what brought you to where you are now and, and Swift Solar, obviously a company you founded um, and focused on manufacturing solar panels. Could you say a bit more about what they, what they do? Yeah. Yeah. So we, what, what we're doing is we're commercializing these, these perovskite technologies. So this, the, the perovskite, it's a, there's a huge number of perovskite minerals naturally occurring in the crust of the earth. In fact, it's one of the most naturally occurring, most abundant, 
actually occurring minerals in, in the earth. The materials we're working with are, are man-made versions. Um, we, we have the, the hybrid organic and inorganic ionic materials that we can make and, and process very cheaply in the labs or in, in the company. Uh, and what we're, what we're doing is we're commercializing a very high performance version of these perovskite cells. So what we're doing is we're, instead of just having one layer of, of, of an absorber layer that absorbs and harvests the sunlight and, 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 and then converts that to electricity, the efficiency of those are limited to about 30%. In fact, that's a th thermodynamic limit of how we convert that sunlight to electricity. What we're doing is we're layering two layers together, or at least two layers together to make what's called a tandem solar cell. So here we can actually, so one, one cell harvests one region, one range of colors in the solar spectrum, and the other cell harvests the other region or a complementary region. And that in tandem, the efficiencies can actually boost at least theoretically towards more like 50% of conversion. Uh, mm -hmm. in, in a practical sense, uh, a single junction is, um, is a record cell of a single junction is about 26% or 27% for silicon. Uh, for these tandem technologies that we're making, we're aiming at a practical limit of about 35% efficiency, mm -hmm. which is uh, doesn't sound like much, but when you think about you know generation over over decades of, of power and also the knife edge economics of photovoltaics, it's a huge would be a huge game changer. So so that's what we're developing uh, at Swift. And is there obviously more efficiency sounds good, right? And you've said the 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 ingredients are pretty easy to find to build one of these things. I mean, is there any reason to think that the cost of these perovskite cells will be higher? You know, once, if, if they're at the same scale, is there any kind of fundamental reason, you know, is there gold in them or something like that, that would make you think that this thing's more expensive than the existing uh, silicon technology? No, so from, a, from, from the actual perovskite side, they're all earth abundant materials, they're, they're metal halides and, uh, and, and cesium halides. So these are very low cost and very abundant. Uh, there will be, like any solar cell, we do need electrodes. That there will be some metal, probably silver or, or copper, uh, in, in these, but they're trace amounts. So that, but that's similar for any PV technology. Uh, I think the, the so, the, so the idea is we'd get this efficiency boost with uh, with at least comparable levels of cost. Uh, it wouldn't be adding much, and um, but really, it's 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 the volume of you know silicon which really makes it uh, at the moment so cheap and, and the projection would be at least at a module level there'd be at least similar costs mm -hmm. but if you have what, what we're doing at swift is we're particularly developing uh, panels that can be can be lightweight for example and so you can think about different installation regimes or different applications as well so this opens up it bring, brings down the other costs of solar particularly for the you know the balance of systems costs the wiring the installation uh, and, and, and the inverter and, and with efficiency as well that's bringing all of those costs down as well Interesting. That's a really interesting point, right? Because it's sort of, you know, Aurora does quite a bit of work around solar solar costs, whatever it is, it's at, you know, a thousand bucks a kilowatt or something to, to, to install. And, you know, that all of the gains have been in the, a lot of the gains have been in the modules, right, over the last um, decade or so, the less in the inverter, less in the other, you know, balance of system, the labor, whatever, you know, labor costs tend not to go down. But um, interesting that uh, through the mass of the cells, you can, you can impact that. Do, do you think, so just one more question about this, and then I'd like to move on and talk a bit more about research. But um, so solar, you know, solar is one of these. So it feels like perovskites have been promising a lot for like a decade. And there's been sort of waves of different things that never, never quite made it commercial. And, and then at the same time, the sort of, if, you know, if you go back to the financial crisis and there was like Solyndra in the US, it, was, it, it is an industry where, you know, people got excited and then lost money a, a number of times is my, my sense. I could be wrong, by the way. You could challenge the premise of the question, but at least that's my observation. Um, does that make, you've raised tens of millions of dollars, I think, with Swift Solar. So does that make it hard to go out and raise money for, for another sort of solar perovskite plan? Or yeah, does it make it hard? Yeah, no, no I, I think I agree with your point. I mean, there has been, historically, there's been a lot of people burnt by, by, by you know, waves of, of, of solar investment that really just hasn't come through. Uh, so there is, there is certainly, you know, caution from investors. Um, um, the, the reality is we're, you know, developing a new solar technology. It, it, it is, it's a long game. One has to think about, you know, in the end competing with something that has had 50 to 60 years of development and is a very efficient and very good technology. Plus, you know, to make these at volume, you do need huge investment. Uh, so, so there is a challenge in that sense. And there, there has been, 
you know, a few thin film technologies, for example, that have come along and, and, and really haven't been that successful. There's a technology CIGS, for example, which came through um, roughly 10 to 15 years ago that had a lot of promise, but didn't come through. And, and really the problem there was efficiency. It just couldn't live up to particularly, at, at, you know, manufacturing at scale to get the efficiencies you needed to compete with silicon technology, which was getting cheaper and cheaper. And, and so that hasn't come through. So the, the perovskites, uh, you know, that will have that challenge too, but actually from an efficiency perspective is already well beyond where CIGS got to. Um, the record sell of perovskites is now, it's 25.7%, silicon's 26.7%, and it's very likely that we'll approach silicon uh, in the next year or two and maybe even surpass it. So that from an efficiency perspective, I think it's not, it's not it, there's a strong argument for this technology. Uh, where it does need to be proven is in the long-term stability, making sure it can last on, on, on the rooftop or on a solar farm for, for many decades. Okay, interesting. Okay, so so that was good. We went into Swift Solar and, and I have a good sense of what they do. I'd like to step back and, and start to talk a bit about um, research in this field. And the first question that that crosses my mind is is broader than the solar industry. It, it's sort of you know, Cambridge. You're at Cambridge. You, you know, you did your, your PhD at Oxford. You studied at MIT. C- Cambridge seems to have this great reputation as a technical university, and has had it for you know the history better than me, maybe a hundred hundred years or so. Um, what do you think's enabled Cambridge to do that? And I suppose you know Oxford's done very well, but I don't think it has Cambridge's re- reputation here. So you've got a bit of a control control group in a sense. But what has Cambridge done? really well? Was it individuals? Was it policy? Was it random luck? I, yeah, no, it's a very good question. I mean, I think part of it's historical, that, that particularly the, the Cavendish labs and the physics department, for example, was really drove a lot of the you know, big wave of, of, of nuclear research uh, that sort of fueled a lot of the, from the last century. And I think that's, that's historically stuck. So there's been a very strong technical uh, drive from the university that, that has stuck around that's, you know, attracted very good people to be there. And that sort of ends up snowballing and remaining and and also means that lots of industry also builds up around there so there's lots of uh, you know microsoft and google and companies like that embed themselves around the cambridge area uh, with you know there's the reputation then of the the, the sort of silicon fen uh, as uh, you know as the place to be so i think i think it's been partly a historical thing that's just snowballed and, and continues uh, and you know there has still been even recently lots of success and spin outs that have technical spin outs that have come from from the cambridge area yeah yeah okay interesting so it's a a, sort of agglomeration economic you know there there have only been a few nobel prize winners for um international economics paul krugman was one of the last ones and his big big theory is about these kind of mutually reinforcing sort of knowledge agglomerations um yeah i think it's a big part that's a big part of it yeah it seems entirely plausible to me um Okay, and then which all you know the, the 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 question everyone asks is how do I get my own Silicon Valley in my country? And so the, the the ultimate question is how do you start? How do you seed that agglomeration? Uh, that's a we won't touch on that, but um, it begs that question. I, I, I think win a handful of Nobel prizes a hundred yeah, years ago that, probably in good that, shape. That might be random chance. Um, okay, excellent. So so that's the sort of broad research question. So on the on the specific solar research, so it just I, I I laid this out before. So Aurora reckons, you know, thousand whatever it is, right? It depends on the country, but thousand bucks a kilowatt for 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 um to build a solar solar um installation. Modules are around forty percent of that cost, so maybe four hundred bucks a kilowatt. Um, mm-hmm. You know how how look you know are all the gains and I think you said they're not are all the gains in the module component as they have been historically and and do you have a sense a million dollar question about how much lower this can go you know yeah. in, the, in in the longer run yeah so I think I mean sort of to put that in perspective it's about forty cents per watt for the module that that's you know and, and as you say it will vary uh, place to place but that's roughly a, a pretty good snapshot of it there's projections for that to come down certainly to twenty cents per watt and and, and even long term to ten cents per watt. Which is, you know, re- really quite remarkable actually when you think about the cost of this. Uh, that, that's for the module itself. So I think that, and 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 there's no reason that shouldn't be able to happen at least to that ten to twenty cents per watt mark. And in some places it already is approaching, um, particularly the, the, the twenty cents per watt. Uh, the harder gains, of course, on the other, you know, the, the rest of the system. And I t- touched a bit on that before. Balance of systems costs and other things where. Uh, it's very difficult to bring those costs down. Um, efficiency is one lever because then you've got, uh, you, you know, th- that entire solar system is just producing more power. And so that's, and that's a big part of, you know, where we're trying to 
the tech, not just from bringing the cost of the module down, but actually also bringing the efficiency of the system up so that the overall system cost can come down as well. Is another, so let's just say it's 40 to 10, right? Let, let, let's just, it, just to explore this a little bit more. Uh, so we're at, we're at whatever, 100 cents of what, if we're talking in terms of watts, um, and 40 of that is the, is, the, is the modules, and you reckon that can get to 10. Is that to say that with the existing, and it's hard, you know, on the on labor staff, balance system, inverters, those sorts of things, hard to get cost declines with this existing technology. Is that to say, you know, Aurora's view on the long run, long run, low, lower bound on silicon cost is, is, is 700 bucks a, a kilowatt? You, you know, is that, is, that, is that all the gain we can eke out here? Um, and and before, without, without looking at another technology? Because that had, would have fairly big implications, I suspect, for you know, learning curves and how people think about when to invest and, and how to invest. Yeah, I mean, there is there is a limit that silicon can get to. I mean, efficiency wise, it uh, and I said it was sort of around sort of twenty six to point seven percent for the record cells. It's it's practically its limit will be about twenty eight percent. So there's really not that much that can go, and really that will you know that in, ends up in, impacting how much lower the, the the overall system cost can come down. There will be improvements in in, in sort of manufacturing and other processes as well, uh, but it does it does end up putting a cap on it without. Efficiency gains. I mean, my view is efficiency is everything. If you can drive the efficiency up, that's the the, the best lever for bringing down the cost. Uh, and and that's also with the cloud of you know a bit of uncertainty coming up of of supply chains of solar. We've seen that over you know over the last two years, even with with, with COVID and also other geopolitical issues. That it, it, it even these really low costs are becoming a bit more uncertain. And that's that's something that's going to be an issue for the next few years. In fact. Yeah, I was in the US last week and uh, there's one one solar farm that's it's it's ready to energize, except the panels are, you know, in Shenzhen, apparently. Yeah. Uh, so um, there are some there are some issues and, and, and around cost. I, I, I suppose that, that's a good segue to the sort of the supply chain challenge. I mean, there, there's the sort of is globalization in reverse now question and um, is lowest cost globally necessarily where you want to source things? There's a, you know, there's a, there's a sort of who has access to the materials that we that we that we use to manufacture these things. You know, Tesla seems well, uh, well, well um, supplied. Um, CATL, a battery manufacturer, I, I, from what I understand, is having having uh, bigger challenges around these things. Um, is and then there's the ESG bit, right? And and with solar, you know, you talk to. Uh, you know, ESG champions in Europe, uh, you know, who are the utilities who say we're 100% green power, and yet there are strong question marks around the supply chain involved with uh, the panels that you're you're installing. So maybe the E is good, but the the S and the G are are are, are a bit murkier on that. Is it? So the, I suppose my question is: Do you think solar? module panel, panel manufacturing will always be an industry where low cost countries have an advantage or or can you see can you see a world in which local manufacturing a bit like in the wind industry i suppose by virtue of the fact that turbines are hard to ship um is is more local how, how do you see that playing out from a manufacturing perspective yeah i mean i think i i think local manufacturing will be a lot of the future of solar. I think at the moment, one of the issues is the silicon factories, uh, you, you know, the, you need a lot of capex to build them. You need lots of infrastructure. They end up, you need to heat these materials, you need to uh, process these at very high temperature. So you do need lots of infrastructure, and lots of energy associated with that. So it is hard to roll out factories quickly, uh, you know, and, and therefore those places that can do it uh, at low cost, you know, are going to, are sort of dominating. Uh, the, the other issue is, of course, that, you know, having, all of our manufacturing in, you know, really two, two or three geographical centers is, is a big risk going forward. Uh, and I think it's these new technologies, you know, for example, perovskite, where you can actually have much more modular manufacturing, much more modular factories, where you could have smaller factories that would be viable and more dispersed, you know, more diverse in where they are as well, which could actually alleviate um, all of these issues. Interesting. And, and does it mean that labor is a lower cost component in the manufacture of perovskite panels than it is with um, you know, silicon? Not necessary. I think, I mean, it, the, the manufacturing itself can be more automated though. So we can think about these, these materials can be processed roll to roll, a bit like newsprint, for example. So one could think about factories that are much more automated. 
Uh, I mean, it's something where it, you know, it's going to be very hard to compete with, um, you know, countries where, where, where labor is very, very inexpensive. But there is a good example. So first solar, for example, in, in, in the US, so they develop a thin film technology, cadmium telluride, and um, they're doing very, very well. And in fact, they're, um, you know, building multiple gigawatt factories now. They're sold out for several years. Uh, you know, the, the next three or four years, in fact, they're sold out for um, limited by their capacity to, to actually manufacture these. So th there is appetite for it, particularly when, you know, and, and their model is that they can manufacture uh, at very low cost effectively. So um, there is a model for it. And I think there's an appetite for it as well. The, the US, for example, are very interested in, in US made uh, US made solar and, and really bringing back manufacturing for some of these advanced technologies. Yeah. And uh, the first solar example is a good one also for um, the risk of a global supply chain. You know, the, 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 the disaster in the solar sector in the US of the last couple of weeks is this anti-dumping. Um, anti-dumping anti issue um, whereby, you know, there's, there's the accusation at least that um, third, third parties, not, not, not China, but a third party before it gets the US is involved in the supply chain in a way that's in breach of trade policy. Um, and of course, that's, that's, um, that's wonderful if you're a local manufacturer in the US and, and what you thought was a disadvantage may well, may well be an advantage. Okay, so, so we've talked about uh, research and, and the trajectory for cost and efficiency. Um, I'd like to talk about commercialization now. And again, start, start quite broad. You've, you know, you've, you've done a lot of commercialization out of academia. You've, you've started this not-for-profit around education as well. How would you, uh, vague question, but how would you rate the ability of the private sector to engage academia in order to commercialize new technologies? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I think I would say that there is a bit of a, you know, a gulf there between what ends up happening in an academic lab and some of the, you know, perhaps really exciting ideas that, that have been developed that, that probably never go forward. Uh, and I think, um, I think some areas it's, it's very good. I think the, um, there's a lot of, if I give the example of Cambridge, there's lots of um, engagement with, with battery technologies, for example, there's lots of interest from electric vehicle manufacturers working with academics, developing new battery technologies that could then funnel directly into, you know, in, into, the, into the vehicles. Uh, so I think there's some, some hotspots where it's very good. There's some other areas where it's not good. Uh, I think one of, the, one of the slight problems in that is that academics aren't very good at knowing what should be commercialized or what could be commercialized. We get very excited about many, many things, and some of those things maybe, you know, mere academic excitement and, and not be able to be practically taken forward. But some we probably miss the, the opportunity to actually properly take it forward, and maybe that's uh, a bit because we're, you know, from an academic perspective, we're not able to engage in the in the private sector and industry uh, efficiently enough. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's interesting. I mean, I dabbled in academia and, and published a bit, but it is the, I mean, there's the communication bit, which is there are some great ideas where academics are just not great at, you know, being a, being punchy com, commun, communicators in general. So there is, there's some gold in there, but it's, no one's going to go to the effort to find it. Um, there, but there is also that bit of, um, you know, if only, if only they saw the brilliance in my idea and, <laughs> yes. and, and, um, and, and peer, I suppose, you know, Peer, peer review is it's not a commercial metric it's uh you know it, it doesn't reward commerciality yeah. necessarily and so there are some brilliant but non-commercializable yeah. ideas that that academics think very highly of yeah i think also commercialization i mean it is a long a long game again i mentioned it before that particularly for hardware that really it's not going to happen overnight it's you know multiple year efforts so really um you know even even lab activity you need to sort of develop a long-term program to even get it to a point where it can be taken then to into commercialization. Yeah, yeah. So why did you choose to, so we've talked about Silicon Fen, but you founded the business in Silicon Valley or thereabouts. Um, why? Yeah, good question. Uh, so partly because the, uh, the other founders are US based. So I was, I was in the US working with them and we developed most of the ideas. For, I was at MIT and a few of them. Uh, so one of the others, our, our CEO, Joel, Joel Jean was also at MIT with me and there was a few at Stanford. Uh, so a lot of things originated in the US, and we even got some activity going at, at the National Renewable Energy Lab, so NREL in Colorado initially. Uh, so it was partly a, a personal decisions that we, you know, we wanted the, the center of mass to be in the US. Uh, the other is just that the, the level invest of investment we've found 
you know, just the engagement, particularly from private investors, that just is a, a scale up, order of magnitude up from what we can get here in Europe or in the UK. And and in the end, for a solar spin out, you do need uh, you, you do need lots of investment. It's a long game, so we do need to have those with deep pockets to help to support us to get there to the scale we need to get to. Yeah, you do, and in the energy, you know, there's a there's been no shortage of funds. Just an observation on the deep pockets bit. It's sort of no shortage of funds over the last year or two have raised you know ten billion dollar funds for investment in. Uh, you know, renewables, but it is a certain kind of capital and, and it tends to be quite low risk capital. There's, yeah. there's very large amounts of low risk capital, but, um, you know, behind all the very big numbers, there's actually a small amount. And even in my, my you know, my, my, my day job of helping people invest in power assets, the amount of capital for assets that will take a risk with market prices compared to ones that want a 10 or a 15 year locked up contract. This is a massive, massive um, distance between those two. In the US, I think it's a lot closer. Again, there are a lot more people who are happy to take merchant power risk and they're comfortable with that than you, than you see in, in Europe. So that doesn't, doesn't surprise me. Is that, so we touched on this, but okay. So you're, you're building this manufacturing capability in the US uh, you admire for solar and what they've done. It's a whatever 10 billion, 10 billion market cap company. Um, but, if, but, and, you know, you're, and, and you're getting uh, some support from the, from the U S government or aspire to get support from the U S government and those types of things. Um, what would your advice be to Joe Biden, to the DOE around not having a repeat, I suppose, of what happened with Germany's great solar industrial strategy of the mid two thousands, where, you know, they were world leaders. In fact, I think in many, in many ways, the world owes Germany an enormous amount in terms of progress in solar technology and manufacturing. Um, how do you reassure Joe Biden that he's not just going to pump a bunch of money into this industry and then it's going to go, uh, go to, go to a, a low cost producer elsewhere? Yeah, well, I, th I think there it's the, it's the focus on, I mean, you know, energy security, obviously that gets thrown around a lot. But, uh, you know, what, what happened in Germany was, you know, in the end, the cheapest panels were coming from outside of Germany. They were coming from China, for example, and that just meant that they just weren't able to compete. But that doesn't factor in things like, you know, local manufacturing, what the value of that is, and the supply chains as well, all of those things that come from it. So, so I think that, I mean, and the emphasis that the Department of Energy is putting on is, is establishing uh, US manufacturing, for example, of PV and supporting that. So I think that that's on the right track. And, you know, many countries need to do the same. There's, there's a big push even in Europe as well for, uh, there's a lot of uh, Horizon Europe calls, which is the big uh, funding um, funding program for for European uh, research. You know, putting lots of calls out for uh, establishing perovskite PV manufacturing in Europe and establishing a strong base and consolidating that. Uh, so I think the, these are the right movements. I think to to make sure that you know manufacturing is diversified around the world. It, it needs to be. We need to be doing lots of it everywhere, not just all in one or two geographical locations yeah okay interesting well the d if the if the deglobalization trend is a thing that may well support support that direction of travel lock into existing technologies we touched on it before um how, how do you you know how big a challenge is it or maybe another way of asking this question is let's just say we'd never we had all of our knowledge but we'd never produced a solar panel as a as a civilization before um, would we be what would what would the first plant we built look like for solar panels? Would it, would it be a silicon one? Uh, would it be some? Would it be something else? Um, I suppose is a specific question, but also just more generally, um, how, how big a deal is this? How big a deal is this for you? I suppose uh, requiring some sort of government intervention. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, silicon really has developed hand in hand with the sort of silicon industry anyway there's you know the wider computer chip industry that's benefited you know the, the the silicon solar industry has benefited from that and vice versa so i think um, it'd be you know hard to say we, we should never develop silicon or you know that, that we shouldn't actually start with silicon technology the other comment i'd make is even this I mean, the proscope technology i see it as it's not either or it's really taking the baton and be able to then go beyond and develop the you know the, the tandem technologies that can take the efficiency beyond one of the really actually promising routes that will probably will, will be the first commercial product for Proscut is actually a tandem that's on top of silicon. So actually taking the current silicon technology, depositing a, an inexpensive additional cell on top and getting the tandem efficiency boost from that. 
Uh, and so there it's sort of piggybacking on top of the current technology. Uh, and you know, that that technology itself will be very viable because we're you know using the the, the various um, established chains that are already there, manufacturing paradigms that are already there for silicon and then putting the proscon on top. Um, but it's a good question. I think if you ask me if we could get our technology in, in 10 years time, let's say, where we're at scale and at efficiencies and stabilities that 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 match silicon, then then I would say going straight for the, the tandems of, of another technology such as all perovskite uh, technologies. Interesting. Okay. Um, and maybe bringing that, bringing that question back to a swift solar level is, you know, you sit down, you've got strategy meetings or board meetings or something like that. What, what do you see as the big impediments to you realizing that kind of 10 year vision? Yeah. So it's, uh, well, I mean, it, we're competing with a very, very good technology. So there's this, you know, huge established multi-billion dollar industry that, 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 that is there and it's competing with that. And uh, the, some of the, that means from a technical perspective, there is making sure we can at least match the specs of that and particularly the, the lifetime of these cells. So making, you know, the bar is really high. You've got right now, you'd, you, you get, you'd be underwritten for your panel for at least 25 years. In reality, they'll probably last 40 years, most of the panels going out today. So that's, and that's very good. We need that. But it, it does mean that there's, you know, there's an uphill battle to, to, to prove this technology can last for that long. There's lots of industry standard tests we can do and it's passing a lot of those tests that we, you know, but, but it, there will be some risk, especially in the early, early stages that they won't last as long. Um, yeah, and, and it means also making sure there's, there's investors who will see us through, you know, be able to, to get us to that scale where we can actually compete. So I think from an investment perspective, that's a challenge, but there is appetite. There are people who, you know, are really keen to, to, to get these technologies that really show this promise to the stage that, you know, where they can actually have impact. Okay, interesting. So, so bringing the backers along yeah. along with you, um, yeah. and I suppose to do that, you need to show some progress along 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 the yeah. way. Um, but there are, the, I mean, the other comment is that the, with these particularly lightweight technologies, or, or at least different ways of manufacturing, there are other applications where we can actually have uh, some beachhead markets that we can, you know, really develop the technology. And some of those don't need such long lifetimes as well. Um, yeah. One of the really promising applications is actually on, in, in electric vehicles and boosting the range of electric vehicles and here watts per kilogram is really important so thinking about you know not adding much weight but having high power these are really important and so there's a, there's, a, there's a lot of interest in that at the moment yeah it's sort of the it's it's a bit like i mean i don't i'm sure there's a better name for it but it's sort of like the elon musk kind of you know we'll develop the roadster uh and it's a very niche market but it'll help us kind of build out supply chains and learn and and, and things like that. And I mean, I see it with things like green steel as well, uh, sort of, you know, green hydrogen or something. And it's sort of, okay, well, what's a, what's a really niche market, you know, high, high spec aluminium or whatever it is, steel or whatever it is where we can do this in a green way and where consumers are prepared to pay a premium, uh, you, you know, for the, for the product to make it green. Um, so it's a well-trodden work, it worked for Elon, I suppose, at the very least. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so it there has. you go. Is, um, and it's interesting you talk about 40, you know, it is often because we, we we help people with a lot of business cases and forecasts around solar. And I think there was the data point of these, they will probably last 40 years, at least in my experience, the sort of in the financial model, obviously, the longer it lasts, the more likely it is to clear some sort of investment threshold. So you sort of sometimes think, well, is it really going to last for as long as we think it is in the in the discounted cash flow model? But but um you know, interesting that for you know, you're the you know someone who's who's looking at this stuff is is, is thinking forty as as well. Hmm. Good. Um, and what would you just? I suppose one other question on this, and and then I want to talk about um climate change education. But let's just. There's a lot of solar developers listening right now, right? So, what would your in the you know the the only thing they've ever invested in is sil, you know it's the silicon technology existing ones. What they know, they used to. Um, negotiating with suppliers, they're used to connecting to the grid. Um, but in the back of their mind, they're probably thinking, well, you know, is there something else coming along to um, to undercut me during the daylight hours um, or that's going to be a challenge? You know, is there anything they should do? I mean, should, you know, is there, should they, you know, what would your advice to them be in, in, in general? Yeah, I mean, I think from a, I mean, in reality, it's not going to be overnight where this new, new technology is going to come along and just sweep away silicon and, and therefore change trajectory overnight. Um, it, the reality is but it's going to be you know five years to before this technology is really seeing proper commercial traction and probably 10 years to be properly competing with with silicon uh, I mean from a decarbonization perspective we just need to roll out as much solar as we can I mean most decarbonization models rely on a lot of solar so 
So they need to not stop doing that. And, yeah, and I think, yeah, you know, I wouldn't change overnight. But having these, the, you know, the, these new technologies on the horizon is important because it's it's really it's. I mean, you can think of it as the next gen technology where where we can get that efficiency boost and different manufacturing paradigms that that will be needed, and you know that we will probably see in the next decade. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So. Good. So I said I wanted to talk about a little bit about this sort of climate change education, and it is striking. You know, you're you're publishing in Nature and Science. You're you're running a forty person research lab at Cambridge University, uh, and yet you spend your time educating seven to eleven year old children through a not for profit in in in, uh, in ten schools uh, on uh, on climate change. Why? Yeah. It's a Great question. So, it, I mean, just for some context, what we're doing is we're yeah, developing teaching modules for, for teachers to be able to teach about climate change. And particularly what, what we've found, and, and it's in the UK, and in fact, in many countries, that there's a lot taught about climate change, that there's a problem and, and it's going to be a big issue, but there's nothing taught about solutions. And this is actually, uh, you know, a lot of kids are this sort of, you know, the, the sort of late upper primary school levels. Uh, they're very paranoid about this and then they're you know, very worried that there's, they know there's this problem coming and unfortunately they're, they're going to be the ones having to live through a lot of this, but they're, you know, they, in, in their minds, there's not anything that, we can, that can be done about it. And so our aim is to, is to really teach those solutions and there's some hands-on activities that they get to do to, to do that and explore different renewables and different models and, uh, and, uh, of, of, of solutions to, um, you know, at least from an energy perspective, uh, climate change. As, yeah, so that's the motivation behind it, and it's something we're we're trying to roll out to. We've started in about ten uh, pilot schools and rolling out across the country uh, as fast as we can. Do you sometimes worry that you create anxiety in in kids with this type of thing? So, uh, just as an example, so in my house, I've got I've got a six, eight, and a ten year old, and um, and we subscribe to this thing called First News, which is like a, a children's newspaper in the in the UK, and it's sort of every second. I haven't looked at it. I'm, open them for a while but you know there's a sort of climate crisis or something like that and and i think there is sort of documentation of anxiety in children about the you know, the future of our civilization and 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 um species and, and all of these things which are act exactly right right but uh, i think everyone would agree there there's a timing and a phasing at which you introduce things into children's ed education you just don't just hit them with everything up front um, do you ever worry that you're sort of feeding that sort of anxiety with, with young I, children? Well, I'd, I'd counter that by saying, actually, we're trying to, to relieve that, that, that issue because it is something, you know, they hear about, you know, they, they hear the news, they hear what their friends talk about, what the teachers talk about, you know, that there are, there are these problems and they're looming problems and they're, they're aware of it. And I think it's something that, you know, that's not, not going to change that. They're, they're not, you know, they're going to see things on images on the TV. They're going to see other kids protesting, uh, you know, and, and, so, so here it's 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 trying to fill that gap, but it's surprising that actually a lot of uh, educational um, programs don't actually include what we can do about it and what are the what are the ways that that you know what what can they do about it? What can their parents do about it to to help to alleviate these issues? Okay, interesting. And, and just one more: what how would you describe the state of knowledge for your average kind of nine year old in the UK? And by that I mean as a sort of you know, is there a, ha, ha, what percentage believe humans are causing climate change? Um, what percentage think climate change is bad and we should slow it down? Do you have? A, I know they're for quite specific questions, but they're kind of some of the fundamental ones. That in in polling, you certainly you don't see unanimous agreement in in general. Um, what, what's it like with your average yeah, it's, nine, nine year it's, old? It's a good question. So we so we, uh, we actually run a survey to, when we start for the kids and actually ask these these questions. You know what? <laughs> Do, what do they know about and also you know do they know what a what a solar panel is for example uh and it, it is quite surprising that i mean that a lot of them know there is an issue but they don't know much about it uh, and that of course varies where where you ask and where you are around the country for example but but there is a surprisingly a lot you know a lot who don't know much about it and that's i think partly because they're just not taught it in schools there's a lot of talk about the sort of you know and even in, as you move to sort of high school you're taught about the science of the problem that there is this this warming that's happening but then nothing else about it. So, uh, so it's a very academic thing almost, and and I think it's you know a lot don't have much interest in that. Uh, so it's yeah. I, I, but what's interesting also at the end of this program, we actually do the survey again, and it's, there's a lot of improvement in terms of how much they know about it and the awareness of of the topic. And do you 
How do you, sorry, one, I said there was, that was the last, but it, just one more on this. How do you, like, how do you draw the line between information and advocacy, I, I, I suppose, in terms of the work that you do? Because, you know, often, and, you know, Aurora, basically the core of our business is doing, doing maths to help people make better decisions. Um, and sometimes the maths, like, pushes you to, exactly towards a specific answer. And I'm, I'm not sure that's advocacy, mm. but, but it certainly, you know, the maths makes it pretty clear I think what the what the answer should be, or, or you know, balance of probabilities, what the answer should be. Um, how do you how do you draw that line between your uh, yeah you know there are differences of opinion on all sorts of things. How fast we should decarbonize is certainly a, a, a quite rightly a hotly contested mm -hmm. uh, debate. Um, how do you how do you manage that? It's a conflict? it's a tricky one. It's and it's a fine line. I, I mean, I think most of it what we teach is you know just based on on fact and and about you know the things we know at least what the science tells us what we know about about climate change and then what you know what the technologies are at the moment that are uh, that can help to abate this but but yes it, you know it does it, it does become difficult i mean the whole point when they do this program you know there is raising awareness of this issue so sort of in, on one hand that can be thinking about advocacy and and you know that there are solutions that can be done and that they do get more motivated about the fact there are these solutions uh, but it, it's a fine line and i think it's something that you know at least my personal perspective, it's one of the biggest challenges that we and, and they as a generation are going to face. It's going to be the biggest thing that we'll, you know, that, that, that they'll be living through and therefore they need to be aware of it. And if, if some of that's advocacy, then maybe that's, maybe that's, that's what it has to be. Yeah. 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 Okay. Interesting. Well, you, certainly in terms of your professional career, right, rising to the, the challenge as you, as you see it. Um, we finished the podcast with a, with a segment I called overrated or underrated. And I present a few uh, concepts to you about the energy transition and then and then ask you whether you think they're overrated or underrated so let me start um and, and i suppose the, the kind of cognitively challenging thing here is you need to work out how your average you know your average kind of expert practitioner rates these things to because you know that you need to work that out before you work out whether it's overrated or underrated um so first of all the role of solar in achieving net zero emissions globally do you think it's overrated or underrated uh, I'd say underrated. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe I'm, uh, you know, <laughs> I'm a bit biased, but I, I mean, a lot of climate models, obviously, decarbonisation models, put in solar as you know, a big, big fraction of it. But that that number does vary a lot. Uh, the, the biggest question is how much storage is playing a role here as well. I mean, that's in the end, if 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 the storage solution can can be there, then solar is you know very much underrated in the role it can play. If not, then maybe it's about where it should be. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's a great answer. And it's, it's entirely a function. It's, it's obvious, it seems like we'll have as much power as we need when the sun is shining at low cost. And then it's a yeah. question of uh, how much of that do we have when it's not shining? Um, so so implicitly, you know, you're a believer in the evolution of long duration storage or at least, you know, yeah. intraday uh, uh, storage. Okay. Um, second question, what... Do you think the likelihood that lithium iron is the dominant battery storage technology for grid connected storage in 20 years is overrated or underrated? Uh, so I'd say overrated. I'd, I'd say, so, I, I'd, so in 20 years time, I don't think lithium iron battery will be the, 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 the technology of choice for storage. I mean, I think in terms of energy density and other other issues associated with lithium ion batteries. I think there's, there'll be other technologies coming along, particularly those that, you know, lithium is a one plus ion, there's things like um, uh, magnesium two plus ions that can store more energy density. If those can be developed and, and optimized, then, uh, then, then we could see these replacing lithium ion. Interesting. Okay, I won't ask. Uh, Sam's email address is online, so if you want to dig into more detail on those, you should flick him a, flick him an email. But I won't go deeper on that. Okay, the third one: um, expected cost declines for solar in the business slash investment community. And by that, I, we've got these elevated costs at the moment, but maybe go back twelve months or to where they would be, but for sort of global supply chains and anti dumping. Do you think the expectations for cost declines are overrated or underrated? I'd say overrated now, and that's particularly the uncertainty of, of, I mean, COVID times, but also just geopolitical issues going forward. I think there's, it's sort of projecting out as if business as usual, and it's going to be a very uncertain period in the next few years. And in fact, we already saw that with the rate of deployment of solar, it did, it did actually slow for the first time in in, in decade, well, in, in over a decade, mm -hmm. in the last year or two. 
um, whether that's a bit artificial, but I, I, you know, or not, I don't know. But uh, but I do think going forward, it, we won't see the cost decline as as rapidly as we may have expected. Interesting. Okay, case. so the, this is the new normal in, ge- in geopolitics. This is the new the new yeah. normal. So I think it does mean adapting, you know, manufacturing paradigms and technologies to actually suit a future that that, that is more modular mm-hmm. and adaptable. Yeah. Okay. And finally, humanity's ability to hit net zero emissions globally by 2050. Uh, I think overrated. I, I think we're we're not we're not on a good track at the moment. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I I do worry, and I think we need to we need a, a big rapid change before. Um, uh, yeah. yeah. It sounds like the yeah. I think the IPCC agrees with you. Uh, on that one, they've sort of ruled out 1.5 degree warming, which is which is roughly yeah. what um, the sort of net zero by 2050 looks like. Um, but they still in play is two degrees, which is maybe net zero by 2070 or 2080. So um, yeah, there, there you go. They've 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 given up, and they're they're the last they're the last guys to give up on these things. So um, there there you go. Yes, it's, it's a bit, bit concerning. Yeah. Excellent. Well, that's a good note to finish on. Um, a somber one, uh, but thanks for taking the time. Uh, to share your world-leading expertise with us on the podcast. It was a lovely change from uh, some of the practitioners we normally speak to. So, Sam Stranks, thanks so much for taking the time to speak. Thanks very much, John. Thanks for having me on. That was John Federson, founder and chief executive of Aurora, talking to Sam Stranks, leader of Stranks Lab at Cambridge University's Department of Chemical Engineering and Biotechnology. Do keep an eye on our podcast feed for more in-depth conversations with senior members of the energy industry. The best way to do this is to subscribe on whatever platform you use. Thanks for listening and goodbye.